I was heading over to hug him for that introduction. Um, it was really kind. Um, okay, so I'm going to set a little timer here. I got in just when the rain um, started to really come down. Unfortunately, my boyfriend left a sweater, a huge sweater in my car, so I was able to don that as a sort of rain jacket. So I'm going to start out, since um, Chard um, talked about ghosts in the introduction, I'm going to open with a poem that is called Rendezvous with the Ghost, that is from my latest book. And, um, you know, I've always, like, um, kind of wanted ghosts to haunt me, but, um, but they haven't really been available. You know, I'm like, where are you? Um, so this is, a, this is a poem about actually when I really did experience, like, I was like, oh, I feel a presence. And um, it was that of someone who I lost in, like, 2005. Um, so, and it's in, it takes place in this, like, old inn in Maine, and, um, which is definitely haunted. The Harris Secret, like they recently, they're about to change ownership and like their phones are ringing randomly in all different rooms. It's really quite hilarious. And um, it also sort of takes place um, while sitting in a reading. Mm -hmm. Rendezvous with Ghost. Did it, transpire, did it transpire to rise from beneath the floorboards? Did it escape into the room through a heating vent? Suddenly, my head, palpable as an apple, felt its eyes. The folding chairs woven into the room by their rows. The shining caps of knees bent that belonged to bodies that sat with ears attentive as rabbits struck midfield by a passing motor. The poem being read gave us back the image of those metallic blankets underneath which migrant children in pictures slept. It was then that I felt it. It was not like saying, it has been so long, where have you been? Though it felt like that. It was not like saying, nice, you finally turned up, where's my ice cream? And though it did tickle, I once read about a person who was tickled to death. It felt like the opposite of death, which means I felt my hands lying like quiet historians on my lap, as if my books had been alphabetized behind my back. I had waited so long I'd given up. I had always hoped to be glandiferous, sweet as a clove cigarette, or shot through with delinquency, circumspect. It was a fancy fashioned from the idiocy of loneliness, bad as a shark movie, sad as an orphan's eyes and propaganda in which the child you sponsored did not exist. It is memory like this. Once, we curled inside an elegy, like a worm inside a jumping bean. Afterward, I stood and left, walked the halls of the historic hotel, found my face in a mirror, and told no one. But I love him, I love him, I love him. So I'm gonna change the mood a little bit. I was thinking about um, dishwashing the other day. Um, and I was like, oh, I have a poem about washing dishes. And then I chuckled to myself. So I was like, that's a really rude poem. And um, it took me a long time. So there's some bad words in this poem. Hopefully children are not here. OK. Um, and it's kind of like a poem that sort of kind of is a little bit of the attitude kind of um, resides in New York. Yellow rubber gloves. Sisters, why bother? The telling is done. I once fancied myself censure. Sweeping floors with my tail as my arms sunk deep into dishwater, half lost, indeed looking almost as if they had been clean aloft off. Mopping up all that blood, rusty strings on the mop dragging their fat hairs along the linoleum. I'm never surprised when someone calls me lady. They might as well call me a cleaning lady. Though I know they mean lady, as in, what the hell do you think you're doing, lady? I am merely washing dishes, yours. It makes me want to give up, adopt those dozen cats. Makes me nervous enough to count how many cigarettes I've got left. I've seen the lines inching across my face. I'm wise enough to know no great plans are afoot. I have no hope of launching any ships. And besides, I'm done with beauty. They say the hands go first, 
then the eyes. Then you get a little pinched, whiskery around the lips. I'm not adverse to invisibility. I'm already used to getting shoved aside anyway, sitting small as a pin between men spreading their legs on packed subways. I'm the blunt cunt who should have known long ago it's about time I shut my fucking hole. But bring my hands deep in the suds, watch me muck with the dirt of men's dishes. You'll see I really know what I'm doing. My advice, yellow rubber gloves will save your hands, young bitches, awful twats who think you'll never be me. Trust me as I never trusted myself. We're in this together. Look at your hands. Who else did you think he had in mind, undermining your time by leaving dish after dirty dish behind? And try using a milder solution. It may bubble up less, but being less caustic, the fewer skin cells it destroys. Also, lotion is important. Apply it just after washing dishes and every night before you go to bed. Who do you sleep beside? That's from my third book. Um, and then I'm, I'm, I'm trying to sort of like, you know, um, acknowledge the fact that there are books that have remained closed for a long time that I wrote, and then they just kind of, um, you know, you always move on to the new book. And um, it's too bad because, you know, it takes a lot to write a book, right? So this is from my second book, and this is called All My Wives, and it is a dramatic monologue, so it's in the voice of a man who has a lot of wives. All my wives. When I say my wives are cages, I don't mean I'm a bird. Collapsible shelves, they hide their usefulness when not in use. All my wives contain terrariums, terrible and fetid atmospheres in which their salamander selves linger atop damp rocks. Their hands are damp as the tissues they ball in their hands, though none of my wives could make a fist. Not even if I asked, no, not even if I commanded them to. An amusing idea I must someday revisit. My wives are like the small mammal house at the zoo. Their rooms kept dark so visitors may view their nocturnal truths. That anonymous wakefulness we sleepers do not care to know. None of my wives are like lanterns, though their ribs, nor do their ribs sing with canaries. It does my wives good to run my errands, for it keeps them purposeful. I do not allow pockets on their shirts or skirts. Theirs are unforgiving interiors. A woman's hand should always be in plain sight, preferably chafed from dishwash, dishwater and cold. A woman's hand should be kept raw from wind and sewing. When I want my wives to come out, I turn off the lights and crouch to listen as they compare me. Who do I smack more often? Whom shall I take for my queen? They think I take pleasure in belaboring at this decision, yet to think of it is to imagine I might someday purchase a book I've never desired to read. When I snap the lights on, they scatter like roaches. Why read when there are so many worried brows upon which to set the delicate glass of my gaze down? One of my wives petitioned once, one of them dared to cry. They've tried to make me sad with their eyes. Let them try. I'd rather buy a hat, a walking stick, move alone within my chamber, pose before my mirror. I do not need a queen. I do not like tantrums. At times I shudder, alone in my bed, when I consider how their desires must churn like the onset of inclement weather. They could be one, she could be 100. I just saw her shadow skulking down the walk. She's drunk as usual. Her shakes, her heart murmurs, her general unease. Pity the creature, she has a disease. If it gets worse, I'll be forced to consider treatment. All my wives have four legs each. What we call arms may as well be legs, so it seems to me, as I kneel behind each, not knowing one from the other. Only their asses' moon curves aglow in lamplight. With such anonymity, we are pleasured. It would not do for them to undo the tiny latches, the wire doors to their cages. It would not do to lift the lids of their terrariums. Something untoward might escape, roam the grounds. 
for then I should be afraid to walk alone at night, my new hat atop my clean head, walking stick in hand, as I move onward, staking out crevices, damp places that lock my eyes. The fragrant earth, I move atop my inheritance, the herd of them breathing behind me in the dark. At the thrill of their whispers, I stick my stick into the ground, turn on my boot's heel. My wife, on her four legs, waits quietly in the hay. So, jumping over. As you can see, like, I don't really think of my poems as autobiographical in any way. That would be so weird. Like, my life is nowhere as interesting. And it's, for some reason, this reading is taking a little bit of a mean turn. Um, so, we might as well just go with it. So, um, I got really into gardening when I moved to Maine. It was something I never did before and something I would have not imagined myself doing. And really, the first few years were just digging things up and getting rid of them. It was just destruction. Um, and so this is a poem from that period, and it's called Violets. The way some people are about weeds, I'm not as forgiving. I see a weed and could will a knife out my eyes to gouge its root. It has no place in my garden, which means it can go anywhere it likes, but it would be better off counting this flower bed out. I love to think while weeding, and I do so meticulously. I think of everyone who has ever crossed me. I cross the sea of ex-husbands. I reimagine my dowry and regard suitors once worthy who are now shackled to others. Why, I wonder, was I so cruel as I jabbed the trowel in deeper, pressed fingers along the root's length to be certain I've got it all? That'll never come back. I toss the tangle onto the tarry drive to bake distant from its source. That's our glad friend, the dandelion, which my daughter so sweetly hands me, which I see as an evil star with jagged fronds outspread exactly where I don't want, which is everywhere. I'm almost fond of that plant, though I'll never consider eating its greens. Let's not pretend. Compared with how I feel about violets, so grotesque with their rhizomes that are sometimes larger than the as yet unrealized ambitions of their leaves. Violets are possessed of a skank sneakiness that, after reading about it and then taking apart the plant to fully examine it, recognize its design stunned me. The sprightly purple of its face masquerades as propagator while ghostly droplets of seeds flourish beneath the umbrellas of leaves. So close to the earth, they are practically buried, nursing the soil with their paleness. It's pure Hades. My love said, standing at the kitchen sink, why does it seem you want to destroy every plant I love? First it's violets, now daylilies. How could I have known their strange, their orange, their staggered rose thigh stems reminded him of his dead friend, signaling the ghost memory of them white water rafting on the Allagash. He was aghast. But how did the two connect? I'm not sure. This friend poured himself down a sink, departing into the underworld, his last guided trip down the sweet leafy. They call them ditch lilies, which is where I threw them. Must I sacrifice my aesthetics for sentiment? You think I discriminate. I admit that so many tubers, the nubby handfuls of them, along with their audacity to grow anywhere, got to me. I began to think it gross. In my defense, we had a hard winter. How many of the flowers I planted will I see again? No matter. I refuse to beg them to turn their faces toward the sun. I myself have lost almost everyone. Some plants I plant again, others I forego. I don't know. Whisper greeny nudges to plants you love all you like. Say, it's safe to come out now. That's not true. That's not true at all. Give me a break. <laughs> I'm gonna read just one more, and I'll keep it a short one. Uh, maybe I'll go back to flowers. 
I think what I'll do is I'll read um, a poem that's a very different tone. It's a first in this, in this book. Um, and it is, you know, interestingly, um, I don't have a daughter anymore because my daughter um, transitioned. Um, my kid is non-binary now. So I have a series of poems in my book that are about a daughter. And then the final poem in the book, which, I, which is really the one I should read. I think I will read that one. Um, the book opens with a poem about a daughter. And I think I will read that one. But the final poem in the book, I transitioned my kid. And um, it's kind of interesting. So this poem um, is called Lottery of Eyes. And I think the thing to know is that um, I got pregnant using IVF, so it was all very much like a gamble trying to get pregnant. It was hard. Lottery of Eyes. My daughter learns how to read with eyes I can't claim to know the color of, though they started out green, then turned gray, and were one day blue. And naysayers who said they'd turn brown were wrong. They are like leaves to be sure, but they are mostly like the colors that move windward over the surfaces of lakes, little scuffles or scallops or shells of tiny waves combed across a brilliant surface. I cannot answer yes or no when my daughter asks me if her eyes are green. Can you not look inside your own eyes to find what color they are? Too bad our eyes cannot speak the colors they feel, be changing things, the shade of iris accompanying the brow in temperament. When my daughter first learned to drop into a book, she left. She turned off by turning on, her face canceling all reward, recalling to me the time she was points only, three dots on the printout of the sonogram, below which someone assigned the word toes, because she had already learned to disappear. When she first appeared, she was not unlike a slice of paper that's got lost, that's gotten lost inside the photocopier, frustrating the machine, getting shredded in its making. Who are you and how? I just lost this document, which was an entire poem, which not unlike my daughter's twin, who would know by now how to read if she did not run red down my inner leg while I was reading. How was it that I was able, in the first place, to give birth to a pair of eyes? Giving birth is the opposite of being swallowed. Trying to make that match catch, kindle a being, is as impossible as scooping the eyes net through a fish tank stocked with the alphabet. Who can know what and who you will be lucky enough to catch? One fell out the bubblegum machine of my uterus. A blood rush sucked into the godless mouth of the toilet. But this one is sitting across from me right now, reading a book. And even tonight, she is still taken up with the question of eyes. Are hers gray or green? Typically, I dismiss this exchange as an exercise in vanity. Because what a miracle it is, the things eyes do. I made this pair inside me. I can't say exactly what color they are, but they started out gray. And everyone said they'd turn brown as soon as a moon passed over a cloud, but then they held the green mirror of a leaf before them, and one day they were blue, but mostly they're light and gray. And what eyes might have shone from her twin's head, the same set of moon haze gray that peers from my girl's head, or another pair of nearsighted baubles set behind lenses like her sister's. Love is a pair of stairs that smarts like a wound. I forgot to thank the generous individual who brought me here, Shard Denord, and I also um, want to thank Drew for um, helping me get here safely. And thanks a lot for this.